Hi there. Rick Hansen here with Amazing Greats. Thanks for joining us. This is one of the fastest growing Christian podcasts in America today. The show that shares with you life stories from well-known and talented authors, athletes, actors, musicians, business people, and yes, comedians. Today, our episode is with Jeff Allen, who is in his fifth decade as a working comedian. You may have seen him in one of these many shows, America's Got Talent, Dry Bar Comedy, HBO, Amazon Prime, Pure Flix, Comedy Central, VH1, Showtime, TBN, Family Net, and numerous other television show networks. He can be heard regularly on Sirius XM, on the Comedy Channel, also on Pandora and Spotify. He's performed for our troops on aircraft carriers and ships in the Indian Ocean. Looks for him. I look for him in the fastest growing comedy internet sensation called Dry Bar Comedy, where Jeff himself has surpassed 300 million views. Jeff has also produced and started his own sitcom pilot for Castle Rock Television and in the critically acclaimed films Apostles of Comedy and has written a new book called Are We There Yet? Join us for the laughs and life journey of Jeff Allen. We are here today via Zoom from Tennessee to Fox Island, Washington, where we're at here with amazing greats. I'm talking with comedian, clean comedian, oh, Jeff wow. Allen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the tag you're lined with. You're the clean comedian and maybe one of the best and well, well most well-known in the country right now. So um, what is clean comedy anyway, Jeff? I have no idea. It's like Christian music. I guess the notes are the same. I never realized that they were different. Um, I um, it was just I started to, I, to clean up my show. I would I had been in comedy for well. I started in seventy eight. So by nineteen ninety, yeah, we were living in Arizona. So uh, you know, twelve thirteen years. I, I was never really a the, the topics because I was a huge Cosby fan and a Carlin fan growing up. And, you know, Carlin, you can eliminate all the 13 letter adjectives and he has a very clean show. I mean, you could, you can't do, all, you couldn't do a hundred tonight shows like he did, um, back in the seventies and eighties without being, you know, the ability to work clean. Um, so, uh, my kid got caught fourth grade. He got caught in school cussing at his teacher. So my wife and I get called in and, um, they said, uh, we can't even repeat what he, I said, I have an idea what he said. So, and I told the teacher, I'd love to look you in the eye and tell you, I have no idea where that child heard that kind of language, but you know, <laughs> truth was that's the way we talked around the house. So driving home, my wife said to me, you know, that's a reflection on us and it's not very attractive on a fourth grader. So we need to clean up. And I started paying my children a quarter for every bad word that came out of my mouth. And, um, pretty much how I funded their college. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. But it was uh, to become aware of, and it was interesting because the discussion we had with the teacher that day, uh, you know, my son said to me, he goes, well, I didn't mean it. So I said, so what you're telling me is you have no control what comes out of your mouth. Pops in your head, it just has to come out of your mouth. And he said, yeah. And I said, so if that was a six foot four, 255 pound linebacker, you would have said the same thing. And he goes, probably not. And I said, so you, you have control when it comes to self-preservation. So um, I took those words when I got home and realized, you know, I do have control. I just have to be conscious of it and aware of it. And then it spilled over into my act because I'm a storyteller. So I wondered, I said, I wonder if I could do what I do uh, by taking out the language, you know. And uh, it was a fun process. Uh, I got really into words. Uh, I bought a SAT book. Um, and I okay. tried to, you know, like, yeah, acquiescence. I even wrote a routine around the word acquiescence. I said, uh, <laughs> my wife, uh, uh, my, my, I'm coming out with a new cologne for, for men like me. I'm calling it acquiescence. It's made with the, <laughs> it's for real men who know how to comply and it's made with the oil of a jellyfish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so anyway, I had fun with it. And then I realized it made me much better at what I do. It did, um, you know, and then when I got into the church market years later, um, you realize that church people uh, are used to one listening to someone talk for 45 minutes without throwing beer bottles at them. And uh, <laughs> two, they're other uh, they are used to hearing metaphors and pictures painted with words. I mean, the Bible's very descriptive in 
and its metaphors and things. So anyway, it was a good fit. But um, and now because of my faith, uh, it's, you know, it's 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 appropriate. And Eugene Debs, I think the famous communist said that profanity gives people permission not to hear what you have to say. So if you have something important to say it to the public, it probably would behoove you not to cuss at them, you know? Yeah. Um, well, let's start back when you were a, a dirty comic and let's go back to the days when <laughs> back to the days when there was a different, I was just an angry comic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I was just angry. I was a okay, okay, bitter, all right. That's fair. Jaded, cynical guy, you know? So, so you, um, so you're a new, you're a new Jeff Allen. I mean, there was a, this other Jeff Allen, uh, uh from long ago uh, that went away and it's been replaced for the most part uh, with this all new, um, very cool Jeff Allen that we know today. So let's go, let's go back. Uh, this is kind of the dark side of your book. The book's called, are we there yet? Which uh, is just a fabulous book. And I, I got the audio version of it, which I love because I got a flavor for who you were just by how you, you're the narrator, you read the book yeah. and you gave us some little side bits too, which is kind of nice uh, that were not yeah. available in the book, which I loved. But uh, the book starts out pretty dark uh, because your life was pretty dark back then. Can you give us the, give us the gist of what was going on with you as a 20 year old? Oh, as a 20 year old, oh, all, right. all I wanted to do was, party i mean i remember when the illinois lottery came in i was around that age 2021 20, you know and i told my friends if i win the lottery i'm buying a silo full of cocaine <laughs> so <laughs> that, that pretty much says everything I, you know <laughs> where my ambition yeah. lied and my 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 plan going yeah. forward was just you know and uh when i started into comedy in 1978 there was a couple of clubs in chicago but it wasn't like, you know, by 1980, the country exploded. So I had had two years to put together maybe 10 or 15 minutes of material. And I was able to hit the road uh, 50 weeks, you know. I mean, the, the, there were more clubs by 1982 than there were comedians that could fill in the spots, you know. Really? So, okay. yeah, oh, yeah, everybody had a pizza joint. Everybody was doing, you know, one-nighters. They had, you know, then the, the clubs exploded. Then there were guys that were booking 10 or 12 clubs. And then there were chains of clubs and uh, yeah it was a good time to be learning the craft uh i don't think i could do it today based on uh, what i've seen and how they mark uh what kind of stage time young comedians can get uh i was awful when i started just awful so it took me a long time uh to develop the rhythm and the timing that i have you know now uh what was it that what was it that like uh, was there something along the way where you said I really like this idea of telling jokes and people laughing. Did you have, you're such a natural now. I mean, you just, when yeah. you're on stage, it just feels comfortable. Like you're talking to us about stuff and it's really cool. Yeah. Did you have that feeling back in the early days that, gosh, I can tell a good story and get people to laugh. You know, you know, it's interesting when I started, I didn't know comics wrote things down. Um, I just started talking about my day. And I was bombing miserably. And there were nights I had terrible stage fright. So the the first three months I did it, the MCs couldn't leave the room because they didn't know if I was going to do five seconds or five minutes. Um, really? You know, yeah, I'd walk up some nights, draw a blank, and go, "I got to go," and I'd run off the stage. Uh, you know, wow. and nothing to say. And then I saw a guy writing in a notebook at one point. I go, "What do you? What do you? What are you doing?" He goes, "I'm getting my set ready." I go, "You prepare this stuff?" And he goes, "You don't." I go. No, he goes, well, that explains a lot, <laughs> you know, watching, watching how you work. And I'll tell you the first routine I ever got laughed with big laughs. I had a BW bug, um, a 66 or 60, yeah, 60, 60, it doesn't matter. 67 bug BW. And, uh, I had a parking on a hill because I couldn't afford to put a starter in it. So I had a parking on the hill, roll it down the hill, pop the clutch and go. So it broke down on my way to a show one night and I, I come, I had to run the last mile and a half to the club to get there in time to, you know, I ran through the door and I hit the stage and I just started spewing about what a piece of crap this bug was. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, you, the, 
the frost system guy lived in chicago and the frost system is your breath in a rag i said if you're lucky enough to get the heater burning it'll burn every hair off your right ankle it's like driving with a blowtorch on a floorboard you know and then the, the horn and you know and then my son said something like, well, you know, years later, I added the line. My son goes, what's it got under the hood? I said, a tire. That's what it's got <laughs> under the hood. So anyway, it was like the first, but I hit it with angst and I hit it with anger and I hit it I, and it just flowed out of me. And I realized halfway into it, man, they're laughing. So I walked off that night thinking, well, comedy's truth for one. There has to be a kernel of truth in it somewhere. And then it's angst, you know, and then the anger. Boy, that's what I really tapped into. I got, you know, especially after getting married, I got really angry, really angry. And then quit drinking. That that took the cap off everything. Uh, and uh, I had club owners, uh, female, that wouldn't hire me because of the way I talked about my wife. They said, uh, they'd call my agent and go, you know, we like him, but boy, I'll tell you what, I can't have him in here anymore. The way he talks about his wife. Huh. And I was just spewing. So it wasn't even so much dirty as it was just the attitude was just vicious. And uh, it, there was a word those, for it. Yeah. In those early days, you were an alcoholic, a drug addict. Oh, yeah. Gosh, yeah. I can't think of a. I tried to get sober at 25, but I was still doing cocaine at the AA meetings. Turns out that's not a, you know, <laughs> it's not a winning formula for for sobriety <laughs> you know yeah. blast up before you go in and then go to the bathroom two or three times in the course <laughs> of a meeting especially around alcoholic and drug addicts they know what you're doing you know i mean you're not you're not fooling anybody so i made about a year without alcohol but i was still using uh cocaine and uh just miserable so um i knew if i ever went back to a 12-step program i'd stay uh, and it was five years later when i was 30 31 i did just turned 31 when i got sober so and you're an atheist at that point too you you oh my gosh yeah i was a full-blown nihilist i mean I, that was beyond you know because you, you you listen to atheists talk today and they go well you can be this and that and still not believe and i go well, i couldn't i mean i i lived what that worldview uh uh brings i mean i did i mean i got to a point where nothing mattered uh and nothing had any meaning to me at all i mean i tried you know tammy tried to you know what about us and i go that's great what if you get t-boned in a red light then the entire foundation of my meaning goes up and you know and smoke so i i you know again i was just i was confused um i wasn't a an educated atheist i certainly didn't have any answers for anybody you know i had christians come to me and bring me pamphlets and i'd crumble them up and throw them in their face yeah. Um, I was an angry, you know, I was a, an intimidating guy, I guess, you know, you're six foot two and, um, and you're, you're scowling. I was at a bar. I used to drink at a bar in Chicago every night, uh, just by myself and, uh, same bartender, you know, we chatted occasionally, but anyway, I, at some point I noticed, I said, all these people come in here and they don't know each other. And within 10, 15 minutes, they're having conversations and nobody ever talks to me. And the bartender said, you just look like you don't want to be talked to. <laughs> you <know>? So, <laughs> so when I had that air about you, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I met a guy uh, who ultimately put the Bible in my hands, but we were, we were just chatting on the fairway. He was a salesman. He goes, you need to smile more. I go, why? <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he says, you know, it's, it's just it's kind of scary at times, you know, but if you smile, you know, I mean, it, so I would go home and I would try to work in the mirror on smiling. And it was... <laughs> I mean, it was the strangest, the strangest thing in the world trying to get to the point where, and I go, this is stupid. Who, who cares if I smile or not, you know? Yeah. And uh, anyway. Your, uh, your wife, Tammy, who is a key part of yes. this whole story. And yes. sometimes I wondered whether, did, did she have a chance to edit before this went to publication? Oh, we did. We went through the last draft. I gave it to her. I said, you need to be okay with my version of what we went through because this was back when we were 31 to 39 i think you know so there was an eight-year period and the reason i wrote it was for millennials today i wanted those millennials out there that are looking at the materialistic worldview that they've been given for the last 35 years and then add up how do you feel where are you at is it is it feeding what you think is the thought you know what you thought it would be and you know and if not there's another answer you know but we went through 
she read the first two chapters came to me and said, I can't read anymore. We were horrible people. And uh, I said, well, that's the beauty of the story. You know, Andy Andrews, who a uh, friend of mine who wrote the foreword really nailed it when he said, don't give up on the, you know, you'll meet the first two couples, the couple, but then hang in there because the, the, the second couple is who uh, his wife and, and that's who we met was the Jeff and Tammy from, you know, the, the, the redeemed them. And it's interesting. We were just on a cruise with governor Huckabee and uh, I sold, I don't know, 60 books, maybe, I guess. I don't know. It was a small cruise. And people were coming to me going, I hate you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, finish. And then they'd come by later on and go, man, you know, he said, she said, uh, that, yeah, you, why would you share all that? People, that's what they asked. Why? You know, and I go, well, it, to me, I don't know. Is it enough to say I was an angry guy without examples? You know, and yeah. um, it's, so every believe it you... or not. Go ahead. Yeah, but believe it or not, it's it's not a unique story with men. There's a lot of angry men out there, and um, yeah. Uh, Every time you tell that story, and, and now that that story is out there and people are reading it and hearing about it on podcasts and on television, uh, is it like ripping the Band-Aid off the wound every time you hear that story again? No, again, it's 30-some 30, 30 years ago. you know. And, and somebody asked me, why, why, why now? Why did you write it now? And I thought, that's a good question, because Tammy pushed me for 10 years to write it. Hmm. And I, I would use that cliche. I said, I know this sounds cliche, but it'll happen in God's time. And it's interesting, had I written it six years ago before the dry bar phenomenon in my life, you know, dry bar changed my life. Um, it gave me a platform with eight to 10 million people on it to see my comedy. And um, they just responded amazingly to it, you know. It is so nice to be uh, in Utah, actually, and uh, it's even nicer they dropped the charges and let me come back to your fine state. So <laughs> it's always a good thing. She uh, finally finished the book, and she, uh, we spent three days and about 40 hours going through every line in that book. And the one thing she really was adamant about when I talk about uh, her getting involved with another man. The first chapter ends with her in California with another man and we're living in Arizona. And I called it an affair. And Tammy said, take that word out. And I said, why, what is it? You know, she said it was not an affair. And I go, well, what's, I don't understand. She said, women will read the word affair and think there was something romantic in, in it. And there was nothing romantic. He, I, I just wanted someone to be nice to me. Uh -oh. And not look at me with that scowl on their face. She said, Jeff, you have no idea how many days and weeks you looked at me with contempt. You know, um, I, I guess I couldn't hide it. I mean, I, I just, I felt like everything was coming down on top of me. And I, you know, it's interesting. I heard, I, I learned this in therapy, that most human beings will tend to seek externally what they feel internally hmm. so if uh, to justify it to validate it so if you're full of contempt and anger and self-loathing which is not a normal state to be in you're going to look for reasons to justify it so i pointed at her and then i got involved in politics and boy, that was really easy you know when you can when you can blame an entire political party for all the misery in your life it it's a, it may make you feel good for a while, but it does nothing to heal you from all of that contempt and self loathing. Um, I love that. But but you know. and Tammy, uh, you got married uh, young. Uh, you you um, got engaged. Well, thirty's not young. Baggage claim. Thirty's not young. Yeah yeah. Baggage oh, claim. I wanted. I opened the book with the. Uh, I, I proposed to her at Cleveland Airport, Hopkins Airport, at the baggage claim after a red eye. <laughs> Uh, it was an impulse, by the way, if there's a young man listening to this, uh, I don't recommend this. Uh, you know, I had no ring, no plan. Again, I, 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 no plan. I think I talk about that in the book a lot. I, I, I'm not a planner. I just kind of run by the, the instincts, you know, it's, I think when I, when I, when I was reading Buddhism, I remember, uh, Buddha's biggest claim is that it's your desires that cause you misery. So I, you know, my final chapter of 
Buddhism was I just couldn't get rid of my desire to get rid of my desires. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that there's something to that. You know, I, I used to say that my level of misery is connected in direct proportion with my expectations and the reality of my life. And uh, that's uh, that's kind of a good gauge to gauge my misery. So I usually, and I talk about that in a book, what are your expectations? Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, if they're unreasonable, you know, I mean, I love golf, but if I felt I should be a touring pro, I'd be a miserable, miserable human being. So, uh, you know, it's better to put things in perspective. Which reminds you, you're, you're physically at a golf course right now where you're out uh, doing some chipping and putting. I am. I got, yeah, I live in the country. Wi-Fi is just awful. My only hope to get good Wi-Fi is Putin invades me. And uh, Elon Musk, got of sympathy, gives me a satellite to tell the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's great. But you and Tammy, uh, all these, you're still married. And that yeah, is a big years. part of the story. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let, but let's see, let's talk about a little bit about the, um, the, the conversion, because I think your story is um uh, symptomatic of many people, including myself, which is um, your, uh, and you were dramatically skeptic of this whole thing. Uh, in oh, fact, yeah. you you jumped into a whole lot. You you, became, you you went on a search for the meaning in your life, and that search led you to self help books, Buddhism, uh, all of these things. But they didn't satisfy. So tell us a little bit about that period of time where you're searching and not finding. Yeah, and essentially, I don't want to say that it was vacuous and empty. I mean, there were times that I felt fulfilled, but I, I, I liken it looking back, again, hindsight, I what I had was a spiritual thirst. You know, I, I believe in 100%, I'll go to my grave believing this, that we are, we are spiritual beings and temporarily housed in a, in a body of flesh. And um, I, I would read something or see something or hear something and it, it's like if you're in the desert and you get a handful of water and you get it to your lips it quenches you for a bit and then you're parched and that's what the search was for me and i i look at it like it's almost as if god said look i'm gonna i'm gonna lead i'm gonna let you go down these paths you need based on the kind of person i was you know, it would have been nice to have that road to Damascus moment where I get struck blind and all of a sudden I just know and I believe. I mean, you know, I've talked to people that have had that, you know, they just yeah. woke up one day, something profound happened to them and they're solid. They know exactly where they're headed. Uh, I wasn't that way. I uh, very skeptical and um, and I, I read it all and the, the Bible was the last thing that I was going to even look at. I opened it up in hotel rooms. I didn't get it. And again, without, I, I really believe this without the Holy spirit, the Bible is just a book. It doesn't mean anything. But when you have that, when, with that encounter with that, cause Jesus said before he left, he said, don't worry about this life. I'll send a counselor to you in the form of the Holy spirit, you know? And, um, that to me explains what I go through now as a Christian is this old nature which doesn't leave fighting with the new conscience and you know and my only example of how i know that i have something different in me was i bought playboy my father introduced me to playboy magazine when i was 12. thanks dad i mean <laughs> yeah thanks you know as a 12 year old you're like wow you know he goes i want you to learn about women you know which you know in, in hindsight you know not the best thing but anyway, I, I I read and purchased Playboy. I mean, in our marriage, Tammy got me a subscription to Playboy for Christmas one year. I mean, that's where we were as a couple, you know. Um, so the day after I I deliver, I, I get on my knees and I say to to Jesus, "I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm, I can't I can't be a husband. I can't be a father. I can't. I'm barely making through as a comic. I just I'm done. I'm done. In in my life, I'm done." So take me and do what you will. And the next day I go to buy the new Playboy. And for the first time in my life, I got a, I got a guilty conscience about it. I mean, I'm standing at the mini mark. It's as if there's an audible voice saying to me, you can't do this. 
And I'm like, huh? I mean, I mean, it was so foreign to me. Wow. Anyway, I walked out. Yeah, I walked out not knowing what it was. And then I, I remember reading that verse probably a week later. And I go, oh, I wonder if that's if that's what that is. You know, and we had one of those uh, issues that, you know, our car broke down. It was always breaking down. We had a you know terrible car. Uh, and that was always an invitation because you tell an angry man, and I was an angry man, that he can be righteously angry. You know, there's a reason now to be angry. You know, your car broke down. Who wouldn't get angry at that? Well, anyway, I break car breaks down. My family's in the car. And I pull off to the side of the road. And 10 seconds go by. And I look at my son in the back seat. I go, hey, I saw a gas station about a mile or so back. Let's just, why don't you walk with me? And Tammy looks at me and goes, that's it? Because they all brace themselves for the coming Explosion, storm huh? yeah. yeah yeah and i said i don't know why i know this but mechanics pray too <laughs> <laughs> now again it's not a road to damascus but it, it fed me intellectually enough to know this this is not a normal reaction and maybe something's changing and tammy saw this kind of a change in me uh it took her a few weeks before she started coming to church with us and um uh, she has uh, since, um, you know, given her life as well. But it's, it was uh, all the other stuff. She never saw a change. You know, I come to her and I go, I just read this, babe. This is wonderful. She goes, that's great, Jeff. We're losing the house, you know. Mm. And I go, yeah, but I, 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 I think this is what I've been looking for. This is what I've been looking for, you know. And you, you go into any bookstore and the shelves are filled. Thousands of books written by men and women. Uh, trying to find meaning apart from God. And there's just the Bible sits there with dust all over it. Nobody wants to crack it open. You know, and that, you know, you listen to the tape when my buddy Phil said to me, you know, he goes, I said, stop it with the Bible. He was kept quoting the Bible. I go, stop it with that. He goes, well, why? And I go, well, who reads the Bible? And he goes, well, I do. And I go, really? You don't think that's archaic? You know, God, God's word. He says, well, what's in there you don't think is true? And I go, I never read it. He goes, then you're not an atheist. You're a moron. Are you kidding me? You've never read the Bible? It's the most influential book in the history of the world, you know? And you can't even crack it open. That's pretty lazy and moronic. And uh, that was <laughs> yeah, the start yeah. of our friendship. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and, you know, to me, what I found in hindsight, because I went through the motivational books and so forth as well, but what I found in, in hindsight was, the motivational guys out there, you know, there's a long, long litany of folks that are self-help guys. Uh, they're all pulling from the Bible. When you get, when you look, uh, look at it, you know, realistically, that's stuff they're pulling from the Bible, uh, and they're just, you know, rephrasing it and putting it in their own words and calling it theirs. But it's all Bible stuff, really, for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I said when I one of the first few churches I worked, I said I didn't give my life to Jesus so that I would get things, you know, I could have got that through a, a, a Tony Robbins seminar, you know, I mean, that's exactly what those were to motivate you to get things. I said, I wanted some peace and calm inside my skin. And again, I don't know if people know what it's like to wake up every day of your life and just be full of anxiety for, I mean, again, you look around and you check those boxes that the world tells you, I had a beautiful wife who loved me. I had children that were healthy. They they adored me. You know, I had a job I loved. Who wouldn't want to, you know, I mean, I love going out and telling jokes. But all of a sudden, it all meant nothing. Nothing. Hmm. And I'm trying to figure out why. I mean, again, I'm, I, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to believe in God. I didn't want, I wanted something to make sense to me. So anyway, uh, God bless you if you can get through it without him. I, I couldn't, and, uh, I'm, and I'm so grateful. You know, people look at the, uh, the Old Testament, and they, they see this vengeful God, and I see a patient God. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, yeah. How many times do you read the Old Testament and you go, are they doing it again? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come on. I'm doing what you're doing. You know, it's like. Oh, I'm nuts. Now I got to destroy him again. So in your Bible, your Bible was stuck in a junk drawer for a year plus. Yes. Uh, and for a good year, a solid to... year. What yeah. was that? For a solid year, year and a half. I never, and this, this beautiful man, God put in my life, 
never asked me. You know, he sent me the Bible. He sent me tapes and things. And, and we would talk. And then the, the end of our every conversation we had ended the same way. You know, we talked about things guys talked about. We talked a lot about golf. We were avid golfers. Uh, politics, you know, a little bit of politics. And again, I um, I call myself a casual observer of the culture. I'm not, you know, I don't get wrapped up one way or the other. But, um, and then he would say, how are you and Tammy doing? And I would say, not too good, Phil. You know, and we weren't. Uh, we were, uh, in the book I write about, we were 10 minutes from divorce court, going to file papers. And uh, she changed her mind. She had me pull over and said, let's go home. You know, basically the end of that conversation was, you know, when we got married, we didn't know each other. And we didn't know each other. We had no clue. You know, I met her in November, asked her to marry me the following April. She got pregnant in May. We got married in July, you know, and she had a two-year-old when I met her. Hmm. So uh, it was a, um, a recipe for disaster from the beginning. But anyway, I told her, you know me now. I'm trying, sweetheart. I was. I'm trying. You know, she had to at least give me an A for effort. I read everything. I mean, I never read a book in my life till I got sober and tried to tried to fix myself. And I read hundreds and hundreds of books. You know, um, it was interesting. I just heard an interview. I think it was Tucker Carlson interviewed a guy that was in jail for four years for something, four and a half years. Oh, it was that guy that uh, raised the price of the pill 5,000% or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, they threw him in jail for four years. And he said, you know, I'm a Catholic. You know, I believe that suffering is part of our lives and there's always something good to come from it. He said, I'll tell you one thing. In four years, I read 500 books. I haven't read a book since I've been out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I read a lot of books and uh, we, we would get to these conversations with Phil and he would just go, we're, we're praying for you and your wife. And it meant nothing to me. It really didn't. And um, it, 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 again, it, uh, for him, you know, he believes that as the family goes, goes so, so, so goes the nation. Hmm. And, um, you know, they, they've that. done whatever they can. It seems if you look at it now since the 60s, everything they can to create policies to keep the father out of the home and um, not be involved. You know, and, and that's one of the things we keep talking about, about the abortion issue. You know, why, you know, all this regulation, why can't they force the father of that child to take care of that child? At least let the woman know that he's, there's somebody who's going to help you financially, yeah. you know, uh, to raise that kid, you know. So Phil, this is, it, Phil Glasgow is his name, right? Is that right? Yes. And he was, so he's yeah, a Yeah, he hates it when I give his name because people oh. start calling him. Ah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but he sent you massive numbers of, of cassette tapes back in, in those yeah. days that sat around and never got listened to for the longest time. Kind of right. walk us through that period of time and you're kind of you're stepping your foot into this whole Christian thing a little bit. Again, yeah, I was seeking. I will I will say that. I was seeking. And uh, Jesus is very clear. You know, you seek and knock and I'll answer. But stop seeking, you know. And again, reading all my books, uh, self-help and, and, and whatnot. And so now I'm reading Ayn Rand. Um, by the way, I this was the 90s when I read Atlas Shrugged. And the uh, Arizona Republic, where we were living in Phoenix, did a survey of their readers and asked what the most influential books in their lives were. And the first one was the Bible and the second one was Atlas Shrugged. Hmm. And I said, I've said that if I was not a Bible believing Christian, my worldview would be more in line with her and her philosophy. I believe that we are responsible for our own lives. Um, and, um, uh, anyway, um, so I was reading Ayn Rand when I met Phil, um, and, Tammy and I had just kind of got back together after that side trip to the courthouse. And um, it wasn't good. We were not, I mean, I still didn't think she wanted to be married to me. I just, you know. So um, I I finally come to the conclusion if it's money, because we were losing the house. We were, we were losing everything. We were bankrupt, you know. And um, uh okay, I need to accumulate wealth. Well, I was never taught how to accumulate wealth. My parents never gave us any instruction on saving money and 
putting it away and building towards something. So I, here I am golfing with this businessman I heard about. Um, he's worth, he just sold his business to some foreign entity for millions. So he's a millionaire. He's out doing comedy for a hundred bucks a week. I couldn't understand that. He was the only MC in the comedy clubs to pull in with a 550 SEL Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> We were all taking Greyhound and, you know. Yeah. So anyway, we're out golfing. And I asked him about accumulating wealth. How did you? How do you get wealthy? And he said, "You well, based on our short conversation, you don't want a lot of money. And I go, I don't. And he says, oh, gosh, no. He goes, uh, you can't handle what little you have, apparently. And uh, it would be a burden. And he said, I can give you one tip that'll help you. And I said, please. He goes, never, never buy anything on credit that depreciates in value that should cut down about 99.9 percent of your purchases you know yeah. and it's a wise thing you know it really is uh ramsey built a whole yeah. empire a- around that so yeah. um we're golfing and then uh i kept it keep hitting them about uh, how do i make money where do i you know anyway he said look you can't even begin to enjoy the creation you know, till you have a relationship with the one who created it. And I thought, wow, that's wise. And that's when he said, yeah, that's in the Bible. And I go, what? He goes, the whole relationship thing. There's a way to have a relationship with the divine. And I went, yeah, okay. You know, and uh, a couple, you know, and then we got into that discussion, you know, where I said, stop it, man. I don't want to hear about the Bible anymore, you know? So before we left that week, I had really grown to like him. And it was more you know, the, the, the AA talks about attraction over promotion, you know, rather than promoting AA, live your life in an attractive way and then alcoholics will see it. Well, that's exactly what it was. I mean, the way he talked about his wife, the way he lived his life. Uh, uh, and um, so we, we kept in touch and he asked if he could sign me up for some Bible tapes from Denton, Texas, uh, Tommy Nelson's church, Denton Bible Church. And I said, sure, as long as it doesn't cost me any money, I don't care. And he asked if he could send me a Bible. And I said, sure. I, again, you can send me whatever you want. Again, I'm seeking. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm open. My mind is open, you know. Uh, so anyway, tapes came, you know, every every two weeks I got a tape, uh, a manila envelope with two tapes in it. And I would just throw it on top of the fridge until that got covered. And then they were all over the house, you know, a year and a half, close to a year and a half, maybe, you know, never opened one up. And he never said, you know, I sent you tapes, you know, just how you and Tammy doing, you know. And uh, so when the time came, uh, she took the kids for the summer and I knew she wasn't coming back. School year ended and she says, I'm taking the kids. You're draining me. I mean, it was always in my head. I mean, it was just, again, you know, you're talking about a nihilist. I mean, you know, I was sober, but I was miserable and I was not pleasant to be around uh, yeah. at all. Played a lot of golf by myself. And, uh, you know, so anyway, she gathered up all these tapes and then threw them on the floor. Uh, and I said, uh, just leave them there. I'll listen when you're gone. And, uh, with the, you know, what a couple of days I walked by and started that argument within myself, which is, again, interesting to me. I mean, again, um, if there's nothing outside of us that speaks to us, then where does these dialogues come from, you know? I go to open up a tape and it says, there's nothing in there for you, you know? And it's like, I end up with this wrestling match in my living room. I never had a trouble opening up a Springsteen tape, you know, never. There was never a conscious decision about right or wrong or. So anyway, I opened it up and it was Ecclesiastes, which starts out meaningless, meaningless. All in life is meaningless. Is there a better verse for a nihilist to hear? I mean, I, I, you could pick the entire Bible apart, and I couldn't find a better a, a, a better verse out of all these tapes, uh, and that so my heart you, leapt, yeah, because it was so true. I knew it to be true. I said, "My God, that's so true. It's meaningless." And then when he gets to the verse where the eyes never Solomon, this is thousands of years ago. The eyes never get enough of seeing, the ears never get enough of hearing. And th- I'm looking at my video library, I'm looking at my audio library, I mean, and thinking about the culture in general, it's just constantly bombarded, buy more, buy more, eat more, listen more, do, you know, all of this. I mean, it resonated with me. And and I felt the, the first sermon I heard was basically this, life without God will have no meaning. Without meaning to your life, there's no purpose to your life. And without purpose to your life, you're going to commit suicide. 
and you may not physically commit it, but you you'll die. You're dead. You're you're a soulless creature walking the earth without purpose. And um, yes. I mean, I I ripped open every envelope looking for more Ecclesiastes tapes. And to this day, it's my favorite book in the Bible uh, because of the honesty. Uh, most Christians don't like it. They think it's a cynical book. Uh, but I would, if I was king of the world, I'd make every incoming freshman in high school study the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> and uh, and then in, outgoing seniors take a refresher course before they hit the college <laughs> campus. <you know? laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man! It, it, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. I was just going to say, uh, uh, Tommy's uh, conclusions were basically: eat Rocky Road and uh, go to a little league game with your kids, man. You know, I mean, you know, there's enough. There's enough trouble waiting tomorrow for all of us. So today is the day. Just enjoy the day, and you know, uh, it, it's just age wisdom. Wisdom gains in in age because it works you know we keep thinking that our generation is going to find something new and it's it's not yeah. solomon said nothing new under the sun you know sun rises sun sets and everything in between is the same and that period of searching was not like uh over the weekend or a week it was was it seven years or something like that seven or eight years i mean i always say this if god had sat me down when i walked into alcoholics anonymous and said this is what this is what i'm going to put you and your wife through for the next seven or eight years of your life but at the end of it you're going to know jesus and you're going to know a peace and an understanding of the universe that you never knew you you could imagine it'd be beyond your imagination i would have never signed on I would have never. I mean, there's no way. I mean, especially if he listed all the garbage that we were going to go through, you know, and yeah. which is why the AA program is the best program there is. It's one day at a time. It's 24 hours, and you and you look around, and again, it's attraction, not promotion. You look around, you see people that are peaceful, contentful, happy, and their stories are the same as yours. You know, I almost killed myself with booze and drugs. You know, I couldn't imagine a day without it. And there's somebody sitting there with 20 years of sobriety, happy as a clam. And I'm sitting there, you know, 20 hours in going, I don't think I, I can't make this. And they go, you don't have to, man. You can lean on us. And that taught me nobody does life alone. You're not going to have a full life alone. You know, what's his name? Uh, Thoreau wrote Walden Pond, you know, but, you know. I can't imagine he stayed out there much past writing the book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, was there was there a time when you said, "By golly, I, I I guess I believe in this Jesus guy," and by golly, I guess was there a kind of a pivotal moment there that 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 you you switched? Well, I went to I went to uh, I, I the Ecclesiastes got me into the Bible. And I voraciously, she was gone. She took the kids. I had no work really um, that summer. So I was home all the time. Um, so I was listening to Bible tapes in the car, all of the car. I mean, I, I I jumped into that book with both feet. I Probably a year and a half's worth of tapes I listened to in two months. And a lot of them I listened to. I didn't have the TV on. I just had those tapes on. So I got a chance that August, I was working a club in Arlington, Texas, which is next door to Denton. And I called my buddy Phil up and I said, hey, I'm going to be in town for the week. I'd love to go to church and meet Tommy Nelson. So anyway, I got a chance to meet Tommy and, and be gum on his shoe. You know, I was like, oh, my God, like, like a fanboy. You know? <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we've since become good friends. But uh, matter of fact, he wrote a blurb for the book. But you know, I think that day he kind of looked at me as like, holy cow, man, this this guy needs some help. But uh, and then I went to Phil's house. And after uh, after lunch, he said to me, uh, when I met you, I, I God put it on my heart. You were looking for something. And um, wow. have you have you found it? And all I could think to say to him at that moment in my life was if Jesus is not who he claimed to be. Then Solomon was right. Suicide. You know, and I wasn't going to, I wasn't suicidal, but I, 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 I understood the physical death thing. It was like, you know, there's, the, there's no life left in me, none. Yeah. So I got on my knees as a child and I said, I'm yours. I, I don't even know what that means. 
know, when I told Tammy, um, I was a born again Christian. She goes, what does that mean? I go, I, I don't know. I heard it in a church one day. I, I have no idea. You know, in a sense you read, you know, there's, there's a rebirth, a spiritual rebirth of, of you. And then the, uh, the Holy spirit, you know, all of the stuff that, that I, I now believe. And I know in my heart through, through living it, through lived experiences, um, we've had some really profound moments over the years that no other explanation could be than they were just divine. You know? Did it take uh, Tammy too uh, long to come around or not so much? No, a few, a few weeks. Um, it was interesting. Again, you know, you're, you're married to someone for seven years and every six months they're coming to you going, it's going to be different, babe. I, I got it now. I got, you know, it's like, okay, Jeff, you know, so, we had one discussion after she found out I was a believer. She said, so if our children don't believe and they die in a car crash, our children go to hell, right? And I went, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a leap. Yeah. <laughs> really? Wow. Okay. We're on heaven and hell. I said, look, sweetheart, I'm brand new at this. I am. I have no clue. All I'm saying is, you want to come to church, come to church. You don't want to come to church, don't come to church. And believe me, if it's like everything else, it'll fade away. <laughs> and about three weeks, she saw there was, again, that side of the road car thing where I didn't blow up and scream, where I was asking her about her life, her day. I, I'm, I'm assuming that scowl was off my face. That was so, you know, and she was still involved with that guy. Hmm. Hmm. you know and i told her i said look i'm gonna leave you alone babe and you know when we left the next day I, I write about it in the book uh when we left the airport the next day and i picked her up after finding out about it i kissed her on the cheek she said that's it i go it's, I, i'm exhausted baby i'm i'm we're a mess you and me we're a mess but i said if you want what you want is in california I, i'm not going to stand in your way you know there's a there's a saying that every man needs to get downwind from himself. Well, I had gotten downwind. I mean, I did a, a lot of soul searching. And, you know, every man has to ask the question, would I be married to me? Hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, think about it. I mean, it doesn't take long to go. You know, I remember uh, Stephen Covey wrote a book, Seven Habits or whatever it was. I never got past the first habit. I think he said, write, write out your obituary. What do you want your children, your wife, the people closest to you? What do you want them to say at your funeral? And my first line was, I want my children to say he always had time for us. And I broke down and sobbed. Mm. It was such a lie. Such a lie. Even when I was home, I wasn't home. My head, I was filled with, you know, stuff and things yeah. and get away from me. And you know, it was funny, uh, cut to last summer, we had all four grandkids visiting us and uh 10 down to six and at one point i'm sitting in the living room reading a book and we have an open thing and all four kids are running laps being chased by the dogs around the whole living room kitchen living room kitchen living room and tammy walks over and kisses me on the top of the head she goes my how things have changed and i go yeah isn't that noise wonderful and it breaks yeah. breaks my heart thinking of how many times I told those beautiful children of mine, just be quiet, you know, mm. yeah. stop bothering me, stop bothering me, you know, well, you had, I, 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 has, has anybody our age, anybody our age that was a parent can listen to cats in a cradle and not stop. <laughs> <laughs> I would hear it on the road. I'd be driving on the road in the middle of nowhere, like Wisconsin and just sobbing in the car, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just Harry Chapin, take doing. it, take take it away from me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> knowing what I was doing as a father. It's just but you had good. some great advice for your sons, each of them at their at their weddings, uh, that you yeah. shared at one point along the way. And I thought they were so powerful. Could you share those with me? Yeah, I sat them down with both of them and said, uh, I put things in you when you were you're too young to remember. Uh believe me, they're in there. And uh, your wife will draw them out of you. And uh, there'll come a point where you'll behave as a man, that you, uh, you'll you behave in a way that you think is unbecoming to who you think you are. It doesn't define you, but it's in you. And I said, if you want to come and talk to me, that would be great. And uh, 
my oldest son went to Iraq. He came back with PTSD and TBI and hmm. uh, his marriage was in trouble. And we, we went to my four year old granddaughter's dance recital, which is just as cute as the most beautiful thing in the world. And uh, we come out to the parking garage and my son is in the process of ripping the door off his minivan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, you know, he's a bull. He's a, he, he, he hauls HVAC. I mean, he's a, he's an ox and his beautiful wife. And I, I watched her. She never said a word. She just let him go. And he, the door ripped off and he's mm -hmm. standing there, but now he's embarrassed. He's full of shame and humiliation, which I know that. And his beautiful wife walks over and she says, uh, Aaron, why don't you go sit down and, and get your breath and we'll, we'll get the door on and we'll go home, okay? And it still chokes me up today. Yeah. I looked at, When we got in the car, I told Tammy, praise God for giving him that woman because most wives would go, stop doing what you're doing. You're making an ass out of yourself. Stop it. Stop it. You know, and it just escalates the anger. You know, and I know that because that's what, Tammy talks all the time. You know, I've told her for 37 years, if you would just let me blow up, it has nothing to do with you. I do this alone in hotel rooms. You know, I don't need a, a I don't need a, a witness or somebody to come over and tell me to calm down. Just let me vent. Yeah. You know, the Chicago Bears tick me off. <laughs> all right. So you are now enjoying um you're uh, enjoying your career enjoying your life enjoying your marriage and grandkids and all that uh, and and clearly you found you found purpose uh, and one of the things i'm hoping that you can share with me is a what do you what do you consider your purpose and b have any advice on how anyone who's listening could find their purpose Wow, you know it's it's funny if you you ask that because it's everything I'm doing today. I was doing when I was miserable. You know what I'm saying? I was a comedian then. I was married to Tammy. I was married. To, you know, I had the, the children. Um, in the book, I pose five questions that I really I have to visit at least once a month. I try to visit it more but what defines me it's important to what defines you i mean most men would say their vocation well if that's what defines you what happens if you lose your vocation mm -hmm. um but if you ask me today i'm a child of god first and foremost i'm i'm, a, I'm his his son uh, you know i was born and raised by jack and arlene but i'm god's son now and from that i'm a husband to tammy i'm a father to aaron and ryan i'm a, a grandfather to evelyn vivian Lydia and Caden, and then I'm a comedian. And those five things get shifted in order. I mean, I get on the road where all of a sudden, all I think I am is a comedian, and then things are out of whack. I mean, all of a sudden, I'm getting snippy and snotty with her, and I'm, you know, so that's an important question. What defines you? And then, and then what do you value? Because the values have changed over the years. I valued things years ago, but today I value integrity. It's, it's over everything else. You know, it's interesting. I don't know much about politics, but I have people, I hear people say, why would Trump keep going through what he's going through? Everybody knows if he just dropped out of the race, all this stuff would go away. They just leave him alone. But it's his name. That's his entire legacy. It isn't the buildings. It isn't the golf courses. It isn't what he built. It's the name he passes on to his children. And then it all makes sense. If you want to live an integrated life, you know, you know, and that's what to me integrity is. You just integrate how you live with what you believe, and it's important to know what you believe. Uh, if you if you're a liar, a cheat, and a thief, and you live your life that way, then you live in a life of integrity, according to you. I mean, it's you've integrated your entire life, but don't get upset when things go south. So anyway, uh, what defines me? What do I value? What are your expectations? We talked about that earlier. Um, you know, it's important to have, you know, I always tell Tammy, if you lower your expectations of me, I could meet him and you'd be a happier woman. I could tell you that, you know, <laughs> but yeah. it's important to know 
what your expectations are connected to the reality of whatever situation you're in. And then um, uh, what, what voices do you listen to? You know, we live in a noisy, noisy culture. I'm a firm believer, garbage in, garbage out. I, 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 I want to shake young men at the airport when I see them playing video games on their phones. I want to go over and go, do you realize you could listen to Jordan Peterson's podcast with John Lennox, a mathematician from Oxford? It'd be way over your head. You wouldn't understand half of what they're talking about. But what a way to spend an hour, you know? Than this mind-numbingly that does nothing to feed any part of your body or soul, you know. So, a noisy culture. Pay attention to the voices you listen to, um, and then where does your hope lie? If it's in a politician or a state institution, uh, I, I don't know how you. I don't know how you have any peace in your life because that's constantly in flux. And if anything that that your hope lies in is external or earthly. You know, I think John Paul Sartre, um, this is anecdotal. I don't know if it's true or not, so don't hold me to it. But I love the quote. Near his, uh, near his end, he was an atheist. And near the end of his life, he said, in, in order for anything to finite, to have meaning, it has to be attached to something infinite and fixed. Mm. And uh, I, don't think he, I don't think he used the word God, but I think that's exactly what God is. He's infinite and fixed. And um, uh, I, I, I cling to that book. Uh, and I cling to the words in that book that this is not the end. So I'm going to try and believe me, I, you know, I'm a long way from uh, sainthood, you know. Uh, but I'm. Uh, it's the goal of mine uh, to pass on a name to my children that um, isn't the town drunk because I was the town drunk at one point, um, and um, I, I want. Uh, I want lots of people at my funeral i think tommy nelson they asked him why he does a thing called young guns he mentors young men for a year and um they asked him why he did, does that he says i want young men carrying my casket <laughs> <laughs> you know? they need to be strong yeah yeah okay. i want to pour into people who who at least respect me enough when i die they'll pick me up and drop me in the dirt you know <laughs> and uh <laughs> How can we, as a, as our amazing, great audience, support you? First of all, obviously, buy the book. Buy the book. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Then buy the audio version, too, and read along with you. Um, so th yeah. <laughs> that would be great. But I love the audio book because I really got a feel for who you are. And I've, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos and other interviews. And uh, you're getting out there. And, you know, you're just such a fun, funny example of uh how to live life so thank you for oh thank you today. that's a compliment thank you very much what a great guy hilarious jeff allen his clean comedy is his specialty and you can find it just about everywhere thanks for listening to yet another inspiring story of a life changed through the grace of god i encourage you to grab his book or the audio version of it are you there yet it's available right now and his comedy is available on Dry Bar Comedy Streaming, Sirius XM, and on YouTube. This is Amazing Greats. Thanks for making us a part of your podcast favorites. And thanks to Clem Daniels, our producer.